people. He's been doing events for us for 12 years. And now our special guest, the one and only Paul Thomas Anderson. You ha Jim Planet's here. Oh. Best gaffer in the business. <laughs> Paul, welcome. I, you know, the the last time you and I uh, had a conversation, you know, we were well. There was a, a time a few years back you had just finished There Will Be Blood, and we were at some banquet, and we were just talking about writing, and you, we were both dealing with a, a similar thing, and I, I thought it would be a good place for us to start now because you. You didn't say what you were working on. I, I kind of, in retrospect, I think it might have been the master, but it was right after There Will Be Blood, and you said that you had been working on something and you were very excited, but there, there was something new that was taking over inside it, and you were puzzling over whether to follow it or not. You were, you were basically, you know, just catching your breath to kind of jump in. And I just, I guess the first place to talk about it, just about writing, is about surprising yourself and going with the surprise. And, uh, does that relate to the master? Am I? Am I? Because it seems. Uh, it must have been. It must yeah. have been. I don't. I mean, that sounds exactly right. That sounds exactly like something that I'd say, <laughs> particularly at that time. Um, that the kind of. I mean, I don't remember it exactly, but I do know that feeling when you're done with something, and just enough time has passed that you're clearly moving on to something else. Um, yeah. And it's a great time because. In some ways, you just you get your um, you get your energy back, you get your excitement back, and and anything becomes possible. It's not you have you've been working so long finishing a film, you're finishing something, and yeah. it's a kind of it can be depressing actually towards the end because it kind of is done and it's out, and there's a sadness that happens, and then you get to writing, and you're there's just a world of possibilities at any turn something could inspire you or get you get you excited again and or you just get you're working with something that maybe you've had pieces of which uh, it sounds like that's exactly what was going on and something happens some you write something down or somebody says something and and there's a world of possibilities suddenly again it's a great time as as maddening as maddening as it can be it's it's a wonderful time and uh, particularly because Yes, there's a road in front of you, but it doesn't. It's not costing anything, you know. There's no clock ticking. There's no people sort of. Yeah. There isn't. It, it's it's private, which is a great thing. Yeah. It. I mean, watching the master. I mean, it. Part of the excitement for me. I mean, maybe a, a hint off that conversation, but it seems to be something that I, when it happens in any movie, I trust it. I mean, you in the master, I, you get get us involved with Freddie Quell. You know, it was played by Joaquin Phoenix, and it, it, and you don't know where it's going or who, it, because he, he, he manages to surprise me in each new scene. Mm -hmm. I, I, the previous scene does not predict the next one, and then when he wanders by that boat, and then he gets involved with Lancaster Dodd. There's, okay, this is even anticipating he was going to meet the guy because you know there's promotion of who's in it. It's like okay, this is not following the way I, you know, I mean he's he's on the boat and he doesn't have the conversation with him yet. And I just. You know, could you talk about, uh, I mean, I think, well, it, a lot of the arguments people have about the movie is, you know, who's the protagonist? And I think, I'm wondering how, how much was that your argument, even with, with yourself? Um, well, yeah, God, it's funny you should say that. It reminds me of, um, I mean, there's like a voice, the kind, our voice of reason tends to be Dylan Titchener, who's the editor. He didn't end up doing the master fully, but... Um, I give him things that I'm writing, and he'll say things like really strong classical screenwriting things to me all the time, like, <laughs> well, who's the protagonist, you know? And usually I'll, like, you know, throw the pages at him and storm out and <laughs> say, well, let that fuck, you know, but he, but he's there to kind of provide these, these questions, so sort yeah. of push, pushing, well, if I'm pushing a direction that's less kind of classical, he's probably there to push back. And the same thing, I think, with Joanne. So, um, and I think it's it's about hearing those questions uh, enough and knowing that you've provided enough thought to them that you are ready to dismiss them, you know, that you can feel confident saying, yeah, but that's not what I want to do, you know. And I know that maybe that's a more, a more traditional way to take the story, or perhaps I should answer that question. And until you can kind of reach the spot where you you feel enough confidence to sort of 
that you've genuinely thought it through to say, no, I don't want to do that, and I know that perhaps that's what we should do, or perhaps that's a great kind of classic screenwriting question to ask, you know, what's the plot, who's the character, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that if you can get to the place where you say, fuck it, and, and but, yeah. but with enough, with enough, um, I guess with enough c authority and confidence, it doesn't, it just means that you're trying to listen to some other part of yourself that's at work, and yeah. so yeah, I don't know. Well, you know, it, it, it's 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 an interesting problem, and it, it it you know it's it's great that well, let's take I mean Lancaster Dodd for instance. I mean in a you know well, if you say what is a protagonist, who's the protagonist? It's like who's going to transform the most? If that's th that would be the classical right. thing. Right. That's and, right. And so okay, here's here's Freddie Quell. He's he's transforming. Where he becomes a salesman in a store, but he's already working on that girl getting her to drink with him in the in the dark room. And so it's like you think it's going to be about them because he's asking her to transform right. in some way. But then what was what really surprised what took me aback just as a viewer. I mean, I'm not trying to formulate it, but in trying to understand my reaction later, it surprised me about Lancaster Dodd that he wanted to get in on that liquor that this guy's brewing. Right. See that it's like he's invited. It's like okay, that's why who's the protagonist? Because who's going to transform here? I mean, and 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 it remains the kind of question throughout the movie. So that you know, it's a. So yeah, um, but you know, but then again, um, God, you're making me think more about this film than than I probably <laughs> thought about it, which is good. Um, but if you, but maybe part of the story that we were telling is a, is is somebody selling transformation and the possibility of transformation, and and maybe how either impossible that is or how possible it is. So there's a rub there, you know. If yeah. you have if you have a character who um, who maybe fundamentally is is not going to change, or, uh, or then you've got a real screenwriting problem on your hands. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and I guess the only thing to do is to invest in that in and of itself. Yeah. You know, invest in, in 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 that you have a character who cannot change, who maybe the most he can change is to put a suit on and hand out flyers on the street and not wallop somebody in the back of the head for not taking the flyer. Right. That that's enough of a change. Yeah. Um, and I suppose it's probably sort of taking stock and, and realizing that you're making, maybe you're going to tell a story that requires an investment for the audience um, solely on the characters and uh, at the expense of any possible plot <laughs> that they might be expe expecting. And if they do invest with them, then ev hopefully, ideally, every nuance of their struggle is what makes it dramatic. Um, right. Uh, uh, that every nook and cranny of, of how that goes is can be worth two hours. To some people, it probably isn't. You know, it's, it's, it's not enough. Well, it is true, too, though, that each of us, I mean, you know, we were talking about, uh, we were naming a couple of movies, I mean, uh, uh, Full Metal Jack and other films that, pe that come up in people's estimation, maybe because they give them a second try. And it seems like, I wonder if you're not conscious of aiming for that second try, hoping that that there's enough enough mischief in the movie that that, that, that people will actually oh I'm going to take another look at this thing. Is that does that ever enter your thoughts while you're formulating? No, it, it does. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, God, it w it's great. You know, that pe we've we've had sort of a weird thing with this film. People were really not liking it the first time they saw it, but for some gravity took them back to it again, and they sort of say, oh, I loved it the second time, which is weird. I mean, we. didn't never could never attack something feeling like it was obligatory to see it twice you know no. i mean it <laughs> should you should attack it feeling that it can it can it can work successfully you know whether it's on a big screen or whether it's on a phone or whatever it yeah. is um but perhaps the way that the story navigates and 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 twirls around is not um as traditional as um it should be so I don't know. Well, it you know it, it off of something you said a little earlier. You're saying that you know if if maybe if the people are there enough, you you, you watch them for two hours, and it's like I feel like that when people come back to something, it's not that you're obliged to see it twice, but that maybe the character was so damn alive, you actually reacted to them as if you met them. You're not seeing a movie. It's like, I hate that fucking guy. Right. You know. Right. And so it's like, and it's like, oh shit. You know, what, was he right? You know, it's like you you meet some, and you you're, you're thinking about it and you get to meet the characters again. Anyway, that's the sort of weird physics of, of somebody changing their opinion on a movie after the fact. It's usually there was something that hooked them and they didn't want to have the hook in them. Sure. You I know? mean, 
Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had the experience of seeing films that I absolutely loved, and then you know you see it again a few months later, and you don't, y it doesn't connect to you at all. But I've had, I've had the experience of films. I have it with records too. Like I'll get mm. a record from somebody. I'm dying. I'm dying for their record to come out, and you put it on, and you just go, what, what's going on? And perhaps <laughs> it's that, perhaps it's that you had expectations about what it was meant to sound like, and yeah. it didn't. Mm -hmm. And you know, eight listens later, suddenly you're like. What was I thinking? This is great, you know. Some you just kind of can groove into what they're doing, and God, I don't know. Um, but uh, you just kind of made me think. Um, you're talking about, you know, when Freddie gets on that boat there, just talking about rhythms. I mean, I always remember reading like you're supposed to have some, you know, by p on page thirty. Yeah, it's uh, there's a big action, some you know, indelible some event, big, yeah. and then page sixty. And I've always tried to stick to that. I've always yeah. thought that that was a really good mm -hmm. thing to swim back to shore with. And um, when we were editing the movie and putting it together, um, my goal was to get to that first scene when they're processing each other. I don't know. How, I'm hoping everybody here has seen the film. <laughs> <laughs> it was gonna be really dull, but <laughs> that, that first scene when they're processing each other, that that, yeah. that, that would start around 30 minutes, and um, mm -hmm. we struggled for a long time, and f suddenly, magically, we did it. We got like that. That starts about 32 minutes in. So, if there's a rhythm that audiences are used to, that something yeah. happens at that moment that defines the film, um, I w we we kind of hung our hat on that being um, it, rhythmically, you know, or page count wise, minute wise. W what would be an indication of what the film was about? Because I think that's all we re that's what we had was a film about these two men connecting to each other. Yeah. So I suppose I was trying. To, uh, I suppose it's a long-winded way of saying you're abusing the privilege of the first 30 minutes to do what you need to do to sort of meet this guy and then meet that guy and introduce anybody else and then land at 30 minutes with what need what an audience may traditionally need to, to hold on to. Right. Makes yeah, sense at it all? It does. It does. And uh, something you said earlier about just a, a guy who sells transformation for a living, right? Uh, I, it's, it's, right. It, it's so it does it, it so draws a good circle around Lancaster Dodd, but I wonder at what point did that enter your thinking? Did you, I mean, was that just something that you were thinking about and you were waiting for the character to arrive, or or was the character already in your head and you... You oh God, you're talking about Dodd. Dodd. Yeah, yeah, I mean, did you begin to define him after the fact? I mean, just in terms of your own process... Dreaming him up and and get putting him to work for you, did you have a theme in the mind early going in, or did it oh did no, that emerge? No, 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 no. Hopefully, if I've ever had a theme in mind, I mean, usually that's just like the worst. You're mm -hmm. kind of then you're, <laughs> yeah. Then you know you feel yourself, you feel yourself writing, and there's nothing worse than that feeling of kind of chasing after a theme. I mean, that's always like writing, and it's worse for me. You know, um, the best things kind of become something and you're just happy it's there. It's just, um, I think I had um, a character, you, it was it was a sort of larger than life character and yeah, there was inspiration from L. Ron Hubbard and I didn't, you know, all these different things I was sort of dragging from and had the two of them together, which never seemed ideal just because they were actually kind of quite similar, you know. And normally mm. I think you're supposed to, th the better way to go in terms of getting better writing is having two characters that are more opposite, you know, that way you yeah. get more traction and stuff. But um, ultimately, if you ha if things are going well and the characters are coming out of you or, you know, they're going to guide you how they're going to go. Yeah. And you, you yeah, I lost my train of thought. No, that's okay. Well, let me, let me help you. Uh, it, um, in terms of Freddie Quell, one thing that struck me about him, you know, I mean, he's he has cousins elsewhere in your work, you know, like like Barry and Punch Drunk Love. You know, there's a an aspect of him that's as you describe uh, that you don't know if he's gonna he, there is in his warehouse or is he gonna you know bite the head off the, the you know the guy. You know, he has that same. Mm -hmm. Violence bursting up in him in a very different form in a way, but he's he's somebody who has the same challenge. And in a weird way, I mean, oddly enough, although he's much more articulate and seems to be uh, more high functioning, you know, Daniel Plainview mm -hmm. is 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 not far removed from these guys. And so it's like, um, 
I'm just thinking, you know, where just what gets you rolling? It it seems like there's there's this guy that that you can call upon, and and Lancaster Dodd's not that different either, because even though they're 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 alike, I mean, when they're in the jail cells opposite each other, you see, oh, <laughs> here's the real Lancaster, or right. maybe one of the guys in Lancaster Dodd. Right, right, yeah. Um, well, that's the classic thing, you know. You always set out, you think you're writing writing drastically different characters, but ultimately they share. There's so much in common, but um, Hopefully, they you find different ways to sort of to deal with them or to manage them. Um, I had a little bit of that Freddie Quell character, just that stuff that was based on stuff that wasn't even a character. It was stuff that was based on fact, stories mm -hmm. that I'd heard about guys coming back from the war, stories that my dad had told me, stories that I'd heard um, just around, you know, guys drinking booze out of torpedoes, this kinds of stuff. So you know, sort of a collection of episodes. And I remember at a certain point reading um, a great short story called. I believe it's called Bucket of Blood. John O'Hara wrote oh. a great story about a fella. It starts out, he's just, he wakes up in a uh, hospital and he's, uh, he comes to and he's having this great conversation with a doctor. He's just had his appendix removed because his appendix is burst on this uh, train and he doesn't know, he wakes up, he doesn't know where he was. And there's just this great conversation at the beginning of it between a doctor and um, this patient, this guy. Mm. Right? And uh, I started um, to transcribe, I just wrote it down in, in the script form, thinking, oh, maybe I'll, this would be an adaption or something. Or as I've done before, too, you sort of steal something. If you, you, you got, you're bored and you've got nothing to do, you know, yeah. there's no better exercise than just write somebody else's words down to see how they look typed out, yeah. just to get you inspired again or to get it moving. And that's what I was doing with this John O'Hara thing. And by the look of it and the sound of it, it seemed to fit with, some of these other things that I had had lying around. So this, that character started to come more and more, and you just start finding pieces of them, and um, you hope that they start to to talk to you, um, yeah. talk back at you in a kind of, in a weird kind of. It sounds hocus pocus, but in like a weird kind of seance. You hope that you are not there at a certain point, that yeah. they're just doing the work for you. That's when it's at its best, you know. Well, it it. You know, when you were talking about, um, you know, you hope that you, you start on it, you think it's different every time, and you feel it, 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 the same things are coming up. I, I don't mean to put all those characters on the same no. petard, but it's like, I remember when uh, Daniel Day-Lewis was speaking about There Will Be Blood at one point, he he had actually approached you because he's, he, he loved Punch Drunk Love so much. And, you know, there's like... And I think that what's going on, I mean, and, and I don't uh, want to read into Daniel Day-Lewis's mind, but I'm just thinking I get what I sort of sparked to what he was saying because I thought, you know, there's something about Barry in Punch Drunk Love that's universal about all men. Even though he's got this, he's got a condition that sort of puts what what every guy goes through, but it's on his sleeve. So we get to see it in him. It's not like, it, you don't feel it's the same old, same old. You feel something more, much, much more true that it's like, this is a universal thing, and I'm so glad to be seeing this out in front. So it, it's so as a dramatist, I don't think it's you're in the position of having to say the same old thing, but you're you're going. You're, there's something that interests you, right? And you're you're setting your you're setting for the horizon again, but it's like you're you're moving off the guy you did before, but you're mm -hmm. still heading in the same direction. That's kind of what I was thinking, and it seemed like somehow Daniel Day Lewis kind of caught the gold fever too. He sort of he liked the guy that you were trying to find, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and you know, yeah. Um, Something like Daniel, um, I mean, I, I think was thinking two things when you were saying that is that I kn this might sound funny, but I the uh, there's the unifying thing there uh, b besides me, sure, is Adam Sandler and Daniel Day Lewis, Joaquin Phoenix share so much uh, in terms of, of a, a, as performers. You know, mm -hmm. um, I know people will laugh because if some people don't consider Adam a, a serious actor, but I do, mm -hmm. and they're um, attack on um, acting and performing is, believe it or not, quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of that that thing is there. But I was just thinking about Daniel Day-Lewis and that movie, that role, if you to talk about that for a second, is that so, so, some, something so much clearer about that character, too, just because his ambition to have a character like that whose ambition is so clear, I mean, it kind of it's it's kind of can be gold and for for screenwriting you know you, there's no limit to kind of pushing that mm -hmm. that thing forward um, when you get into something like Adam character that you're talking about 
it 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 is more ambivalent. It's it it is a bit more confused about exactly what the fuck is going on here. Yeah. You know, whether yeah. it is mental illness or just basic frustrations, yeah. or whatever. You know, it's something else. And that's probably equals a uh, box office dollar sign. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, it's a, it's an intangible because one of the things. That that made me sit up, you know. I mean, I'd I'd enjoyed Adam Sandler and other things, but I, you know, what what you had him do in the first part of that film is, you know, he's sitting in a warehouse without anything on the walls, and he's just wearing a suit, and he's at a bare desk, and not saying. Well, he's talking into a phone, but there's no actual dialogue. And I'm watching this guy. I'm practically watching the back of his head. So I'm going, well, this is there's something going on here that you managed to tap into that that isn't i mean it's it's in the staging it's in the it, but it's also in the in the physical presence there's something going on inside this guy that I'm trying to find out I want him to turn around so I can find out what's in him and and that's a very real wavelength you tuned into with that guy and it seems that uh, I don't know that that that's where he is in common with Daniel Day-Lewis and Joaquin Phoenix because they all have that uh, they have that going on and you can't name it well yeah uh, that and uh, you know for lack of a better word it's, it's called a movie star yeah. You know, I mean, that's like w like they just they have some kind of thing that makes them so watchable, and you film them with a movie camera, and you can't take your eyes off them. It's and it's if all of us had it here, we'd be movie stars. You know, it's <laughs> like fuck. Um, but but I um, just if, to talk. You you I love that you're talking about Adam and that, that film because I I like that film a lot too. And I, I have to say that was something that I wrote specifically for him. You know, that was like. A ground-up creation to kind of write something oh. for him, and I didn't really even know him. I just kind of had a sense of him and had a desire to work with him and a desire to kind of mix things up for at, at the time when I was writing. I wrote it very, very quickly, and I, I, I have to give you know if, if anybody likes that film, it's because of Adam because it sort of exists because of him and wanting to get to know him and, and allowing him to, to do something with him. And you get to do something very, I mean, I, want, I don't know if it's complex, if complex is the right word, but it's like you're asking, here, what I loved about it, you know, and when I revisited it is that here's this guy, he's got all these things with the seven sisters. I mean, that's like a fairy tale character, you know, he's like right. Snow White, no, he's a guy and he works in a warehouse, but then he gets into this conversation with a girl on a porno line and you know, she's asking him all these hot questions. Are your pants off? And I was like, No, I've got got all my clothes on. Are you jerking off? No, no. So some, you know, he's like, and and we're he's being really nice to her. He says, and he's talking just about his life. So he's this guy with these all these chivalrous instincts. Mm -hmm. And because of these chivalrous instincts, of course, the girl on the other end is feeding it to her guy, and they're all get, they're going to blackmail him. So no good deed goes unpunished. Here he's being chivalrous, and mm -hmm. he's getting screwed, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it almost ruins his life. And then he has to actually become a real chivalrous guy and go out and slay the dragon so it's a it's a very primal little story and i i guess the the, the it's such a pleasure and it's so unexpected the, the dangers he gets into you just don't expect that but i was wondering in finding you say it came together quickly did you did you have a sense that he was going to get into that kind of phone call or did that surprise you the day that that you were writing it and suddenly he's in a conversation with that girl i mean just it would oh can god you remember good how question that i'm trying to remember um and i don't know if i do I feel like um, I knew a little bit about that phone sex world, just sort of uh, tangentially from some stuff that was left over from Boogie Nights and mm -hmm. researching that world a little bit and knowing some people that were involved. And maybe it always had that kind of lingering that there could be a great opportunity to do something there. Um, and, uh, you know, stories that I'd heard of um, sort of blackmail situations and stuff like that. And um, but the fairy tale thing you're talking about, I suppose I remember, you know, maybe there was some like half cooked ideas or things that I wanted to do when I wrote that movie. And more than anything, it was trying to just like completely find a new way to work. Um, we just, with Jim, we just made Magnolia, and that was like a hundred days of my life and three hours long and all like heavy duty stuff. And I just remember, like, the last thing I wanted to do was that again. So it was just, like, how to keep it fresh and how to kind of, like, shake that off. And um, the the thought was, like, to make something that was small and bite-sized and attack it in a different – and just work in a different way. And, you know, a 190-page script was just – that's insane. So it was just, like, how to do something – the films that I loved, that I was watching, I was really inspired by at that time. I was watching Adam's films just because they were on all the time, and I was, yeah. like – I just, just they'd come across TV and I love them or what everything that Woody Allen does. I, I just that was the stuff that was floating my boat at the time that was making me happy. So trying to do that, 
um, it probably meant not lingering too long with it, just writing fast and just trying to follow first instincts and trying to kind of just dig away and, and not get too hung up, not get too up inside my head and try to write impulsively. I mean, those are the things I remember mm -hmm. um, about writing that and sort of went away for a month and said, well, I'm going to come back in like six weeks and, and I'm going to have something. And I did, and it was kind of pretty good. It was probably about 75% of what we eventually did. And we just started shooting. Um, and with seventy five percent with seventy uh, yeah, I thought it was a hundred percent, but it turned mm -hmm. out to be seventy five percent i mean that that was the kind of lesson there was just like let's just move, let's move fast and kind of disrupt the apple cart and how we're working and cool. and yeah, it was great for the most part, and then there was like big, huge gaping holes that were obviously were the result of working that instinctually and cr and fast, <laughs> so thank God we just sort of like took a break and in the filming, you took a in break. In the filming, we, we we took a break and we kind of we sort of rethought and reshaped and came back again and and did more and and got it to where we wanted it to go. Yeah, it was just and it, so ultimately it was a, it was a successful exercise because it was the opposite way of working on Magnolia. It was which was the goal, you know. Now, in terms of you, you had Adam Sandler firmly in mind, but when you're writing the the, the script, no, he, he hasn't said yes yet necessarily. Do you? think away from him in terms of getting Barry, the character, whole in your head? Did you think of other actors or did you just somehow think of somebody that you'd see in the street? How did you, how did you keep that character alive apart from the casting choice or did you feel the need to? That's a good question. Normally I would do the, something like that, is to not get too hung up in writing so specifically for an actor. You know, you, you've got to write this, this person first and hopefully. Yeah. But I had enough going in, I had enough pieces and half-baked ideas, like I said, pardon me, that I did approach Adam, that I, I said, I want I, I want to do this, and I want to do this in March, and we should get going, and I want to finish writing it for you, something, again, you know, just to do it differently, that, it, no, it was really, like, 100% for and about him, and, and, cr and collaborating and doing this thing together. That's um, great. You know, yeah, I had some other stuff. I had pieces that had been lying around, but it was so clear to funnel them into this. Yeah, thing. yeah, no, it was all about Adam. And you, but, but otherwise, you know, mm -hmm. like with Daniel Day Lewis, um, I was writing this character, Daniel Plainview, and, and I think you know, obviously, at a certain point, you have to start asking yourself if this is a real thing that you're going to pursue. Who is an actor that could do this? And obviously, he kept popping into my mind. But you prob, but I, I probably did the best to kind of push that away and either not get too hung up on it because you start to think, well, what if he says no, but wait, I shouldn't even be thinking about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You just have to tell the story. Right. Um, and luckily the phone rang and somebody said he liked me and he wanted to work with me. So uh, oh, There you go. Well, in in terms of like other actors, you know, like, uh, like um, at what point did Emily Watson enter your mind? Because she's so perfect opposite him. What, did do you did you think did you think somebody completely unlike him? You know, were you were you strategically working your way toward her, or did she come to mind right away in terms of your conception? She came to mind very early on too. I mean, it was kind of one of those things. Um, I talk about trying to work impulsively and quickly yeah. and trying to get that going. Um, obviously, I'd loved Emily in Breaking the Waves, yeah. and had been following her. Since then, and she had a wonderful bit in um, uh, Rock the Cradle. Do you remember? Oh uh, yeah, or, um, right. The Cradle Will Rock. Right. Sorry, um, right. Tim Robbins. Film. Yes. Right. And um, that was on, and I was watching that, and she has this great bit in it, and I just just rem remember feeling it, it just this sort of gravity towards somebody, yeah. and you know, um, and they seemed like a wonderful couple together, and the three of us had a fantastic time together. That's wonderful. I want to ask about, I want to go further back because, you know, there's a point a lot of people are working on their scripts right now just trying to get something launched. I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, Hard Eight, which was originally called Sydney, and that, that's, that's really the first thing you managed to get mounted. If you could talk a little about, you know, where you were before you got that up and running, what, wh how did you develop yourself as a writer and, and a director, and what, you know, just what were the steps you took to just make that first success happen? Uh, um... Well, the first thing I just thought of when you said that was um, that, and I had never really thought of this before, but um, when I was 17, I made the uh, this short film that was called The Dirk Diggler Story, which became Boogie Nights. But 
the distance between being 17 and making this short film, which the format of that was like a fictional documentary, kind of like Spinal Tap or oh, Zealot or right. something right. like that, you mm -hmm. know, which was very easy to do because we were shooting with a video camera. Right. And it didn't matter. You know, that was a great format. If that's what you had, you know, yeah, it fit that kind of style. I remember watching um, Frontline. Do you remember Frontline? Uh, Frontline's still on, I yeah, guess. On PBS, um, yeah, on PBS. On PBS, but they had a they did a piece on Shauna Grant, who was a porn star, un who unfortunately ended up killing herself. But they did a piece on her um, that I that I saw that really inspired um, the Dirk Diggler story. Anyway, the distance between making that when I was 17, which was this little script that I wrote out, it's like probably you know 14 or 15 pages, and writing the script for that was Boogie Nights, I, co I was constantly writing for nine years. I wrote like a full version that was a fictional documentary like, you know, like Zelig. It was like 80 pages or something that expanded it out. And then I wrote another draft, you know, that was the same thing. But then I decided, well, no, I should try to turn this into a film, you know. And I tried, uh, and I wrote it as uh, very probably kind of close to what Boogie Nights is now. It was, in other words, an exercise to learn how to write. It was almost like, um, like I wrote... first novel. Like, yeah. Well, I suppose a first novel was more like um, like I wrote some story that, that I thought was true, that really had happened. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it was like a documentary, yeah. and then set about adapting it. But when I look back on it now, you talk about how did you practice? Or I, felt like I guess I just practiced for about eight years writing that one story, trying to learn how to write, learn how to feel good about putting words together and scenes together and getting it to getting it, shaping it so that it felt good that I was confident and I wasn't embarrassed by looking at it on the page I mean that was really isn't that so much of what writing is is that you're not yeah. humiliated at looking at it yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> yeah and it definitely and it's such a you know it's such a populous movie I mean there's so many characters that are, are alive and I would wonder that in, the, in those eight years weren't you I mean did you Tackle it from the point of view of Amber Waves or Roller Girl, or how did you work uh, the, those characters? Did they take over for you sometimes, and you, you leave Dirk Diggler behind while you just get sure, to know the others? Sure, sure, yeah. sure, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I can, yeah, uh, that's exactly, yeah. Now I'm remembering. You would write, you'd follow a character, and you'd write about them. You know, you could write like little short stories about all of them. You yeah. know, there was lots of stuff that I would write about Amber, that character that Julianne Moore plays in sort of relationship with her ex-husband and, and her relationship to her uh, estranged son. She has a son, I think, that, right. that survives in the film. And yeah. there was much more about that, or there was much more about um, uh, every every character, really. Um, yeah. Um, and I hadn't really thought of this until you asked. That this is probably... Because it, it probably is part of the reason why the movie, watching it again recently, I mean... You feel the weight and extension of the characters. You feel that something's going on down the hallway, even if you can't see what's going on. And they, That's and you, good. You know, and, yeah. it, it, and so <laughs> it's it's a it's a it's a great feeling. You know, it's a, it's exciting to to watch a movie and feel that. But I think that for a writer, I wonder if it's the challenge, how, or if you could talk about the challenge of what to leave in, what to put out. You know, I mean, where how do is there a way you're making those decisions uh, that uh, so okay what wh what do I leave down the hall what do I keep in front I of me? don't know I that's don't know I mean I still don't know I mean I yeah. that's like yeah I mean uh, yeah that's the but that's <laughs> the fun of it that's right. the endless fun of it the yeah. fucking endless like Rubik's <laughs> Cube fun of doing what we do what I, I dare I guess everybody in this room has chosen to do and my, I can't play piano but I imagine it must be sort of similar, just like here are these 88 keys and all these different combinations. Yeah. I mean, um, the, the fun of it is just sort of wondering what you can do without or what do you need. And, you know, you inevitably I probably write way more than I need. But, um, God, the fun discussions in the editing room, at least on this last film, yeah. about like what, what, I, what do we need? I, you know, you don't know. And, yeah. You hope that you find it, and you hope that you make the right decisions. You know, I'm not. E I'm not sure that we have made any of the right decisions all the way along, but they're the ones that we made. You know. Yeah. Now, all the iterations of, of Boogie Nights as it was developing, did you show it to friends? Did you like test it on people and say, oh, they, they're not getting that, and or, or did, did it grow along In the lines? Boogie Nights. Yeah, um, well, across the eight years that you were developing it, you know, and letting it. I mean, you were. Uh, yeah, I mean, I might have shared. Keep it to yourself. I think I kept it mostly to myself. Yeah. I mean, I might have shared it with a few people here and there, but no, I, I, I think it was something very private 
um, that I was keeping to myself. And was Sydney, aka Hard Eight, the, the the was that something you wrote quicker as almost like a I don't want to reduce it to something strategic, but in order to get something like Boogie Nights made, you needed to establish your your credentials with you know uh, uh, you got a a, a, like a, a film a, that's yeah. intimate with just a couple of characters and the, and the dynamics are pretty clear. It's got a, you know crime and you know it. it but it, it, it rides off the development of all that other stuff. You, you, so did you strategically go for that first with the hopes of bringing landing Boogie Night up the lines? I, I don't remember thinking that strategically. Perhaps that was there. You know, maybe the more strategy that, that, my, that I might have been thinking was, I want to make a film, um, and how do I make a film? And um, small seemed... Sm you know, something that was containable that I could go and do, that I could go and shoot seemed right. I'd spent time in Reno mm -hmm. um, with friends, and I and I was actually, I had worked up there on a film. So I knew Reno pretty well, and I loved this actor, Philip Baker Hall, and I loved this actor, John Riley, and I'd worked on a short, and there was similar stuff that I was stealing from that. And it just seemed like um, stuff that I was watching at the time informed it, and it felt like to write something that was that size was something that I could actually go and, and get enough people together and go and do. Um, but I never, if I would thought through even what it was like to make that film, I, I, you know, I probably would have given it up then, you know, <laughs> just like I, not realizing what I was getting into. But thank God I, you know, I did. Yeah, I, mean, I was hooked, you know, <laughs> the second I was there. I was we once talked a little about that movie before, and as I recall, you regarded it as something of a, a very heavy baptism of fire and education because you were in the position of having to fight for your version. You you prevailed. Your, your version actually got out there, but it was like I think every writer in the room can relate to having to, how do you keep your thing alive, you know, the, the keep it from being interfered with. Is there any general observations you can make that are useful? I mean, things, you know, that you can advise out of what you experienced on that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Only because, um, I mean, yeah, sure, I, but... Um, I mean, I, it's funny to look back at that and feel and see my own mistakes in handling that. You know, I was so young and I was, I was completely defending every bad idea that I had and, 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 and because I didn't know any better, you know, I just didn't know. I mean, but I'm, um, that said, I was, I was right, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. some of the time, um, but I just didn't know how to navigate, um, um, other people talking to me about what I was doing. Um, but that said, if the actors ever talked to me about what was going on, there was some instinctual thing that had me completely give over to whatever they, whatever they thought. You know, in other words, they were the people that were saying it. So I just wanted to make them comfortable saying it. You know, and it didn't matter. But anytime anybody outside of that sphere that wasn't actually making the film. Mm. had something to say. Um, I got into a, a paranoid panic. Um, I don't know what it was. Well, it sounds like, I mean, if the actors are giving you a note saying, asking you a question, it's like, well, it's emotional, and it's actually, it's in the direction of what you're trying to do, whereas uh, people saying, well, who's your protagonist? Sometimes it's like, right. get the fuck out of here. You know, I mean, I, you know, they're, they're, you're interfering because they're not, they're, they're going off a recipe and not, not looking at th what you're cooking. But right. Well, I how do you sort that out? Because you have to navigate it, you know? I, I mean... I, how do you sort out like the uh, bad advice from the good advice? I mean, when when it, it, yeah, you, you know what? Notes. It's, it's a great it. question. How do you? Yeah. Um, how do you test it? You know, somebody gives you a note, and you think, oh, and how do you? Is there a way you can test it so you can say to yourself, is there a way to look at your own work? And I, I tell you, I, th I think the only thing that springs to mind for me, because I am a, I mean, I am a fucking slow learner, and <laughs> is really is time you know if somebody sort of made a suggestion to me and i and I, I i usually kind of tighten up and i panic and i couldn't tell what was going on but you know somebody makes a suggestion you know and if i have two days to kind of like you know sit around on the couch and think about it i don't care who made the made uh, the suggestion it's i'm going to steal it and it'll be my idea you know it'll be <laughs> great like but um that's my own personal experience with with navigating that is is just the time to kind of sit with something it doesn't matter who comes up with something to me anymore i probably used to have chips on my shoulder about that kind of stuff but i wish i hadn't because 
at any moment there can be a good idea from anywhere. It just yeah. doesn't fucking matter, you know. And it, and 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 hearing what somebody who who you may perceive as your enemy just because they have a suit on or whatever this kind of thing is is, is a bit horseshit too because they have their point of view and that point of view is valid. I mean, it, it just might not be what you're doing or what you think, but if anything, you want to hear it. You know, yeah. I, I, you know what? Wha where are you coming from? Just to kind of just to kind of get a measure of the course of what yeah. you're doing, you know. Um, I, mean, I mean, it said does some... Does that make sense? Yeah, so it does. Yeah. And I guess the, the, the one counter would be, like, is it that um, sometimes people, are if they're having a problem, well, maybe they're naming the wrong problem, but maybe there's a problem. You know, is that the kind totally, of... Totally, yeah. completely, completely. Somebody will say something. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of an example. It's exactly right, you know. Oh, God, I'll, I'm going to come up with a great example yeah. when I'm in the car on the way home. Um, <laughs> Well, well, listen. While, while uh, oh, but oh, li you're exactly right. You know, um, hear, hearing somebody say something. You're, yeah. You said it best. You know, <laughs> no, it's it's um, maybe somebody has a problem with a scene in your thing, and maybe it is maybe it is that scene, but maybe it isn't. Maybe it's something that's around it. You know, yeah. something that's hovering right around it, and there's a solution that's just within reach. And yeah. and trying to ascertain how to deal with that, it's that's the fun. That's I mean, that. That's the kind of never-ending. Was fun. there anything in the master that you had to defend, even to your coworkers or your actors? Was there anything that stood out where people said, oh, "Okay, I'm with you, but where are we going?" And you're gonna, you gotta think, "Oh shit, yeah, what do well, I say?" Yeah, like yeah. all of it. Kind <laughs> of <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, on that note, I'd love to invite uh, questions from the from the audience and get get people interacting with us. Uh, we have a question here in the second row, and if we could, uh, Jake, if you could get us a microphone. Where is the question? Uh, the question is right I can here. Can you stand up and talk loud? Yeah. Well, we have a it, we, it'll recording. record. Yeah. Sorry. yeah, it's all right. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, <laughs> I've heard a lot of writers, directors say that when a story comes to them, it comes to them in the form of a single vivid image. I'm wondering where story comes from for you. Where's story at its rawest? Good question. Yeah, good question. Um, <laughs> um, I've never had that. I mean, I get, I've never really had that experience of a single image that um, as vividly as that. Maybe I can remember Magnolia. I remember seeing Melora Walter's face looking into the camera or something like that. That was a really strong thing. But I'm n other than that, um, In the I, I, oh. sorry, no, I was oh. just thinking for the master, like, just, to, just to think about that, it was more of a collection of odds and ends and pieces that I'd had for a very long time that were kind of in search of something that was going to, you know, could squeeze it all together, some kind of glue or... Or just working with it long enough that it started to present itself as something that was impossible not to do. You know, because if you're writing something and it's and it's going well, I mean, you know, your fucking house would have to burn to the ground for you to stop. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's you know. But if it's not going well, the slightest distraction of a bird outside yeah. or, you know, the phone ringing or, you know, it will take you away. You know, you could care less. And maybe it was just working with enough things that I had that it was getting to the place where the house could have burned down and it wouldn't have mattered. Um, I mean, to talk, to focus on the master's imagery for a moment, you know, there is something that's very arresting about it that's, I wonder how it interacted with the narrative when you were conceiving of it, because we, you know, a lot of talk because you, you shot in 70 millimeter, you know, and it is particularly valuable to see it in 70 millimeter. That I found because what 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 stays with me are a couple of things. It's like I mean, the I image is of course Freddie Quell lying on the sand woman, which is an image you return to, so it becomes an image that we take away with us from the film. But uh, you know, I wonder, God, when did that begin to occur to you? Because it seems so primal. But around that. Is the 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 light in the sky on the beach over those veterans? I, I was feeling like I was looking at 1940s light, right? And it it, it reiterates when he's 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 accidentally poisoned that that poor farm worker, and he's got to run across the field, and we're zapping along, you know. And it's it's the same light. It's a, and it has to do. It's a it's an intangible. Mm -hmm. it, it's made tangible for us reading about it because we know it's 70 millimeter. But it's like okay, you you were chasing something, and was that it, off this question? Were you 
early on in the writing kind of chasing that kind of light was it, rather than an image? Was that the thing you were going for? Um, yeah, you know, God, you, what's the quote? Um, it's always night, otherwise we wouldn't need light. Thelonious <laughs> Monk says <Yeah>. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I've got two things that popped into my head when you were saying what you said, and I know this is a writer's, you know, thing, Great Guild Foundation thing, so you're not supposed to say this, but that kind of thing with the sand woman that we have in that film and all that stuff on the beach was like, it's the kind of thing when you just write and the script, it just says, Freddie's on the beach after VJ Day. That's all I wrote. Wow. Because I didn't, I didn't had no, I had nothing. I had no ideas. I just knew we needed to do something on the beach. And so it was like, mm. you know, you know, that was more of the director took over. <laughs> it was like, yeah. but the idea as a writer was to not write anything, to kind of leave it. So I was like, you know, to kind of hopefully you find things. And, you know, you, it was the last thing that we did. And along the way, um, Jack Fisk kind of came up with these pictures of, um, these sandies, they call them, sand dolls that they would make in the sand and oh, you know, see how those would happen. We saw those pictures. It was just too good not to try to do one of those. And, and so the sailors that were extras that we had would make them. And, and um, you talk about the light. I mean, listen, you know, good light is good light. You get lucky if it, you got a nice day and all that. Yeah. But um, when talking about 70 millimeter cameras, is that you. You know, the fun of working with any kind of old gear is that you hope and you pray that um, as much of a pain in the ass as it is to work with, you hope that whatever little ghosts and critters are inside those cameras that have been there, that have been used before, hopefully they'll seep under your film and maybe yeah. give it some good karma and <laughs> you can go back out. So that... When they're not breaking down, hopefully those goes away. Well, this this actually triggers a couple of thoughts in me because you know, you know, to talk about something as technical as 70 millimeter with the writers, I don't mean to impose that on the writing, except that it seems as with you know, like in your opening, I looked at your script for There Will Be Blood, and you specified in the first shot that there would be a crescendo of almost violent music over this desert. Now that's a, a very startling effect in the film, so that was clearly there early in your dra your your yeah. process for writing it, it, before there was a film, there was the music in your head that you were honoring, and so that's I'm I'm talking more not so much the technicalities, but the technicalities were serving something that you were trying to get to, and and like and I guess to formulate this into a question, like the I found the Sandys in the research, and I'm thinking that as a writer, you know, there must have been stuff that you were tripping over from the 1940s and early 50s where it, just in your research, and this is for everybody about researching your own idea and trying to trigger it with research, because you didn't need to get those sandies then until you were on the beach, but uh, when you're writing, there were other things you needed to research. And how did you go about that to stimulate yourself? Well, it's more, more like... Um it's more like how do you tear yourself away from that research to actually write, start writing again, you know? I mean, in some ways, I feel like um, it's just uh, to say I was writing the film was just a way that I could lie to my uh, girlfriend and my three kids. Like, I'm writing, but really you're down there researching because uh, because the that is the that's the kind of – it's the, the logs on the fire. It's the fuel. It's everything um, just because the writing part, I mean – it's fast, isn't it? Kind of mostly, you know, and yeah. usually it's pretty good the first couple times it comes out of you, and you, you can work a scene, maybe sometimes it gets better, sometimes it doesn't, but that time spent mm, just trying to hold hands with another period or time, you know, and trying yeah. to kind of get inside that mind of whatever land you're writing about and the ways that things can lead you, you know. Mm. Um, even if they're dead ends, it doesn't matter, you know. I mean, just the time to read about soldiers and um, come back from the war. Re even there's a great thing called the Pacific War Diary, James J. Fahey, I don't know if you've ever read it, but no. he kept diaries on a battleship. I mean, you know, that's like a 300-page book, and just to sit down and read that and to, yeah. read, uh, to read those experiences, sort of go through that. Um, a wealth of material that we had about Dianetics and Olaf Hubbard and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just endless amount of stuff. And there was like a newsletter from the Arizona or something that you found? Abaree, yeah. Yeah, Abaree, yeah. Um, which I, yeah, I, I, I couldn't get through all, you know, t 12 years in volume. I mean, that was too much. But to kind of go through all that stuff was the, m the reason to do this. I mean, the reason to do it was to spend that time 
looking for anything, looking for anything that yeah. might kind of trigger um, an idea or some kind of compassion or some something. Um, so many letters to the editor, people sort of writing into this thing, and that's where you could get stuff. Mm. You could find people's voices, find the way they were feeling about their life or their movement or whatever they were involved in. And, and um, Yeah, because the wonderful w w lines that are spouting out of the characters, they're played by Laura Dern and various others, it just... You do feel you're eavesdropping on another time, you know? Well, I mean, that's, that's not me, you know? I mean, that's like, you know, kind of good writing is stealing and finding little things that people had written or said or navigating it and trying to get in. And, and that is the fun, I have to say. At least right now, for me, that is so much fun. I get off on that. That's what really floats my boat is being able to do that stuff. Um, yeah, it's a time sucker, but it's... it's it gives back, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to move over here to see if there's a, is there a hand over here that I'm ignoring or any, any questions? Okay, we've got lots of questions. Okay, we're going to go to the back, the striped shirt. Keep your hand in the air, yep. And then I'll, I'll get to the next questions. Uh, don't you worry, keep, keep going. Uh, last time I was here, uh, Diablo Cody was speaking and someone asked her if she could have written any script, what would it be? And she said, Boogie Nights. <laughs> so I'm wondering, you know, if you could have written any script, what it, would it be? Uh... First thing that came into my mind was Sweet Smell of Success. Mm. I wish I wrote that. I could put, if I had that on my resume, can you imagine? <laughs> if my if you had my if I had my name and you said look it up on IMDB or something, it said Sweet Smell of Success, North by Northwest, mm. Boast er Ernest Lehman, um, Treasure Sierra Madre, that'd be yeah. cool. Network. Uh, I'd put that on my resume. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I could keep going. I mean, we could keep. I could keep listing films all night. Um, Pulp Fiction, I would put on my list. Yeah. I'd say that I wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> um, fuck. I mean, we could play this game all night. It's a great game. It's like a drinking did, game or something. Did you? Right? I mean, did you? Treasure of the Sierra Madre and Network. Did you, how how young were you when you saw them for the first time? When did when did Doctor you Strange love? Oh yeah. Um, I saw Treasure Saramaji on Channel 9, like when I was a kid, mm. um, and it made an impact, but not this kind of severe impact that yeah. it made on my life um, when I saw it, it again in the middle of writing there. I mean, I'd seen it a couple times, and I yeah. just thought, this is great. But when I saw it in the middle of writing there will be blood, it was like, yeah. I, Fucking head exploded. <laughs> and funny enough, if anybody was watching TCM, it was on this morning. Oh. Um, and I said, I know, there it was. My head exploded again. I was just like, this is as good as, you know, as it, as it gets. That's great. Um, Dr. Strangelove is another one I said. I mean, mm. I saw that when I was a kid. My dad said, oh, you should watch this. It was on Channel 9 again, too. And I, don't, I didn't get the humor. I mean, I must have been 10 or 11 years old. And the main thing I remember is, you know, Slim Pickens riding the uh, riding the bomb. The bomb. Yeah. That. You know, if you're 10 years old, you see that. Uh, I, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. And you know, it's what's interesting. I mean, in this, uh, by the way, folks, there's uh, the the great Kubrick show at the L.A. County Museum, and at the Academy Theater on Wilshire at Lapeer, there's a in the lobby they've got all the screenplays, color xeroxes of Kubrick's personal copies of of what became Doctor Strangelove. Sometimes it's called Edge of Doom, and you see it's various evolutions, uh, because it, it, and I only mention it because it's very related to the process you've been sort of laying bare for us tonight, which is that of discovering it as you go. I mean, part of the power of that movie, you, you can wish you had written, but it was like, it was growing out of like, you know, a whole, a, a whole cluster of inspirations, but and it sort of being logically worked out and discarded as he went along. You know? Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, ho yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah um it's funny, I found an old file the other day, like an old computer. I was looking for something else entirely and came across what obviously became There Will Be Blood. And it was really, I mean, I'd never done this before. Really, I kind of could watch myself, you know, uh. going like in this direction, that direction. I thought, oh, wow, look at my mind. We're going this way and that <laughs> way. And I finally, thank God I figured that out or got rid yeah. of that, you know. Um I, I don't have the ability to do that with anything before There Will Be Blood because I didn't save things like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I was mad to do that. It was crazy. Um, Great. Let me let me get to – there was another question back here. The gentleman in the white shirt was right near the end, and then, then we'll start moving forward. To yeah. uh, I had read an article on IndieWire, I think, that said parts of the master were inspired by a certain John Steinbeck story or there was a Steinbeck uh, influence on certain early scenes. Can you talk about that at all? 
Yeah, that's just I was reading. Then this is just what we're talking about. I mean, even I read a great John Steinbeck biography. It's, I think it's just called John Steinbeck Writer, and it just chronicled his life um, really well, really well written. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on the writer's name. I'm sorry, but um, it just chronicled his his life. Um, after Salinas and going to Stanford and splitting from Stanford and working in different fields and and contained in, inside there were just these great anecdotes of him working in a beet field as a bench chemist where um, it was during prohibition and, and if you worked as a bench chemist in a beet field you had access to all kinds of different chemicals and stuff like that so you could make a really nice potion you could make a really nice kind of booze and um, the way that the story goes in his life was that he realized that he was coming up short on some chemicals. Um, and he thought, well, who the fuck is stealing my booze, you know? And so he also had, as a bench chemist, you also had another chemical that was essentially a laxative. So he spiked this this booze with this laxative, and there he was. He was out in the fields one day, and he sees these guys way over by this tree, like squatting down, taking their pants down. And he said, "I knew it, you know, you stole my booze." Um, so there was a couple things like that, and that I just sort of embellished or was just used to to write and get the thing, get something cooking. Great. Uh, this gentleman in this blue sh shirt, and then we we'll get to you. Yeah. Um, do you ever write something without the intention of directing it, and knowing that you're the director, does that influence your writing process? Um, I know I don't. I, probably, I write pretty selfishly, feeling like I'm writing for me, for myself, to not to direct, but just to write. Like, um, like I mean, for instance, I didn't write. I didn't get a chance to really write today, and I don't feel right. Mm. You know, um, I mean, I feel fine. It's, no, it's it's been an okay day, but it's not as good a day. Mm. At the very least, if I'd had 15 minutes this morning to write, I would I would probably feel just more. Yeah. Fucking together. I yeah. Mean, you know, um, but you can do that like 15 minutes even will just get you uh, just uh, make something it's happen. A, the, it's just enough of a dose to feel like okay, I did something. You know, yeah. um, I tr I try to work every day, and if it doesn't happen, yeah, I don't. I just don't feel as good. My, my day doesn't tumble forward as well. Anyway, um, but no, but directing and I mean, like when you're saying, I, I forgot that I wrote that thing at the beginning of There Will Be Blood in the Script. I mean, obviously I had an idea in my head of the yeah. there would be music and yeah. sometimes you write a lens down, you know, as a director and then it's you write it in there just because it's an idea you have. You may completely throw it away, but it's just that you don't want to forget it. And so I, I, I'll do stuff like that. But, but also try to try to leave things open sometimes so that it doesn't get too there's enough room to do keep doing more mm -hmm. things you, mm -hmm. know, you know what i mean i mean i don't yeah yeah no it, 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 it exactly it's 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 you're you're tricking your memory and your unconscious into you know uh, showing up so that they 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 remember to come back okay yeah this was what we were talking about yeah oh right you know do you know wells tower this writer of wells tower no anybody out here go get wells tower he's got a great book of short stories called um everything ravaged everything burned That's and great he title. was talking i read I, yeah he's great great writer and he i was reading something he was talking about writing he says um you have to get yourself into a form of auto hypnosis and mm. I thought, that is exactly right I never heard anybody say it quite so perfectly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Every go get this book. It's great. We have a question here. Uh, uh, if you could stand and uh, yeah, or just or, well, that they found you. They, yeah. Okay. Hi, Paul. I get the sense that you create from a really unconscious place, um, and it's sort of the place that Stephen Gagan calls like the magical garden, where great shit gets handed to you for free. And I've heard you talk about sort of um, like writing from the gut, and I know you do the early morning kind of thing, um, but uh, my question, and there's a question here, but um, I love the fr first three films of yours, and they come, um, there's such m amazing empathy for your characters and humanity, and some of the speeches in Magnolia are just amazing, amazing stuff, and um, I'm wondering, the the last three movies, when I saw them, the first time I saw them, it was like, had to see them a second time to really um, kind of get them. 
whereas the first three movies, it, they went down very smoothly. And I was wondering, uh, is it coming, is there you finding, like it's coming from a more, are you finding yourself in these, in these more recent movies, like, um, is this making sense? Like it's coming from a more unconscious place. Like, you know, when you see 2001 for the first time, it's like, what did I just see? And then you see it again. And you're like, wow, now I get it. It's like your last three movies have felt very much like that for me. And I'm wondering if there was a shift that went on in your filmmaking that you're aware of. Um, oh, like we're getting more obtuse and more confusing. <laughs> no. Or yeah, or perhaps just reaching further. You know, I, I mean, the, the 2001 is a good analogy because after Dr. Strangelove, I mean, okay, what he could have done another comedy after that. I mean, he goes... He goes way further out, you know. Right, uh, right. But, yeah. Um, I mean, are you, uh, and I guess the question, you know, in, in trusting your unconscious, mm -hmm. you know, do you do you worry about getting ahead of your own curve, or do you? How do you? How do you stay? No, I mean, no. you just, you know, you have to be. Able, you have. I suppose you're going to have to if you do. If you're going to, I mean, listen. It, 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 when you talk about trusting your subconscious when you're writing a film, I mean. Part of that's completely fucking ridiculous, and part of it's completely, you know, all you're trying. Maybe sometime all you're trying to do for the next year is protect. So uh, the the vast distance between when your instinct wrote something down and what it means to actually try to get it financed, go get it together, get everybody out there, shoot it, shoot it in some way. I mean, there's a it's a, and get it into. By the time it reaches the theater, that gulf, you know, between whatever your gut was doing and something else, your brain's had a lot of time to kind of think <laughs> about what's going on. And so I don't know how, if the film business is the best place for that kind of intuitive film, you know, intuitive thinking to, if, if you can do that. It's, but um, I guess to answer your question, I feel like after. I feel like with Punch Drunk Love, when we made that film, something seemed to feel, I don't know, based in all the insecurity and kind of like panic around during the making of that film, we kind of, um, I, we, the people that I work with, sort of emerged with like a newfound confidence. And as funny as that sounds, um, just a different way of working, a different way of feeling good about what you were doing or a confidence. And that's not to say that you get so confident that you don't still get, you know, just stricken with bouts of confusion and depression. But that's okay. You kind of know those things will change, and you trust that they'll change. Um, but that felt like a little bit of a kind of maybe just um, I don't know a, b a different way of working, and it kind of felt that felt more us. Mm -hmm. uh, it felt like we were just somehow getting into our own skin. I was getting into my own skin, and the people I was working with. We just had put enough miles between some things, but that's not to say that we're not all completely still baffled by what we do, you know. But we maybe enjoy it a little bit more. Well, off this gentleman's question about, you know, in a sense, the question seems to be the theme under it is also challenging yourself because sometimes, I mean, it's not that you have to see a movie twice, but sometimes an audience is challenged by what you tried because you challenged yourself. That's it's not becoming more obtuse, but it's like you didn't want to do the same thing twice. You gotta. You got to you got to try and do a, a, an extra somersault, but you, you know, and, and the audience will challenge itself and come back. To, you know, right. you yeah. Know. Um, but uh, I guess w w in relation to that, looking at say Magnolia, you know, Magnolia is is a movie that where it feels like you challenge yourself to do something really wild and uh, really wild, and you're doing it's like a trapeze act. You've got all these characters sort of flying, and they're flying in symmetry, almost like in formation. Cause you, and, and it's good because it keeps you, they're, they're all following one curve, but there's a lot of them, you know? And it was a lot of, it's like juggling, you're keeping a lot of apples and oranges in the air. But and, and with Punch Drunk Love, you got to a kind of simplicity. But are you tempted, I mean, you've, you've moved in different directions even from that in your more recent films, but are you, are you tempted to go back to a kind of symphonic uh, sort of um, idiom like you were in in Magnolia again? Is there any kind of movie that's, that's you know... Um, calling to you now uh, or do you, do you see yourself doing something a broad canvas like that again anytime um i don't know it's a uh, it yeah no i know hard what you to ask you about no i know what you mean but i mean uh, it, um i'm not into the stuff that i was into when i was making that film yeah. i'm into different i'm into different films and different things stuff and different stuff that's, in, that's just getting me off and making me 
feel yeah. excited about making films and um, whatever that's going to be, whatever crops up that you see that just suddenly kind of gets you excited about films again. Yeah. Or, um, you know, um, you kind of have to rely on that. That's going to just spark something in you that's that's yeah. going to push you a certain way. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm like, I'm completely obsessed right now with um, Arch Archipong whatever his name is um they, they call him joe he made syndromes in a century you know the taiwanese director no oh, no he's yeah. fucking great you oh. gotta see this stuff i mean it's the most syndromes in a century and uncle bonami who's past who you can recall his past lives oh uncle bonami i've seen yes okay okay, okay. wow all right maybe you didn't like it but no no i liked it a lot but it was it was one of, uh, no i loved it see like but, that's it, but it's not a movie stuff. like i i wish i could make a film like that there you i go. mean you know like but i guess that's where you know like no, and it's funny about Uncle Bun Me, which is a, it's a strong recommendation, but it is, um, I don't know, it, it, trying to explain it, if I had to try and explain it to somebody, it would be like the great Orson Welles line that a filmmaker should should make movies innocently the way Anna and Eve named the animals, because that's not a movie like I've seen anybody else make. Right, you yeah. Know? And sometimes you can even, I had to think, who? how do I know that name? Because it's like I even forgot it, and then it's no disgrace to him, but it's kind of like my mind kind of, Left it behind for a second because I can't. Uh, I don't have an easy handle to put on it, except right. that you say it and I go, "Oh yeah, that film." Okay. Right. Well, uh, it's uh, like anything. I mean, it's yeah. kind of like you know. Last night, my um, two girls, for whatever reason, got out of bed at like ten thirty. Like obviously, they were up chatting away in the room. They're supposed to be asleep, and they came in, and I was making a sandwich because I was starving, and there was something playing on TCM. With I don't know what it was. It was just, it was obviously like. Um, I didn't look at the display, but it was it was basically just like an, a series of vignettes, performance vignettes, two girls playing piano, uh, two girl acrobats that were sort of walking in this crazy. It must have been like mid thirties, late thirties, and then a kind of comedian who would who literally ate everything, starts smoking a cigarette, eats the cigarette, starts taking part of his suit, eats a vaudeville act, you know, eats the eats the har plays or playing a harmonica, eats it, and you know. It was like talk about inspiring, but just watching these those kind of vignettes, it was like the kind of thing that you see that just gets you you going again, and mm. and that you can see you could see you. I, my first instinct was like, I want to do that. That mm. looks like fun. That yeah. looks like so much fun with performers and getting a camera like that. And those are where these inspirations come from. You know, talking about going back to something. I never want to go back. Fuck that. Yeah. I mean, I want to keep going. I want to keep finding yeah. new things that are. Yeah. Exciting to me and keep, you know, I want. I don't want to go back. That mm -hmm. would be fucking horrible. <laughs> I mean, you know, no, really. No, no, I get you. No, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to be neglecting. Uh, good, we got questions over here. Let's uh, get the question against the wall and then we'll move move across this way. Hi, I came in late. I'm sorry if I distracted people at the door. I just want to apologize, but hi. I guess my you question... Did. Yeah, <laughs> I ruined the, ruined the evening. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I guess my question was, what's always attracted me to certain films is the character development, and the reason I think I've enjoyed so much of your films is just how, I guess, deep you go into the character in the film, even though it's not always as uh, it's not really apparent to other people I've um, had watched like there will be blood and everything they just kind of see it as a movie but there's so much more to all the characters and I was wondering if you had like some sort of um, like system in developing like if you keep like writing about the characters like as you're writing the screenplay if you develop like a whole background for them or if it's just the way that you write you uh, like there's so much to them question mark <laughs> Yeah, we have like a program, computer program. <laughs> um, I don't, I mean, you hope, you hope to get to know your characters and you hope to trust that if you start writing something that they don't want to do, that they'll fight back. In other words, you know, you kind of... Um, Whatever, with the, if you like, there will be blood. Let's uh, hope you, you hopefully you try to write a scene where Daniel suddenly kind of becomes a really nice guy, you know, and starts <laughs> donating money to charities or whatever, and <laughs> or he learns sign language for his son or something <laughs> like that. And you know, you should do do you should try to write that scene. You should try it on your character and just see how long they let you do it to them <laughs> before they reach out from 
inside of your typewriter or computer and just smack you across the face and yeah. say, we're, you, you're fucking kidding yourself. You know, that's <laughs> not what, let's get back to what we were meant to be doing, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah. It, it, it's interesting, too, I'd point out that in, in, this, in, the, in the script, which I was reading today of There Will Be Blood, you know, you d when you introduce Daniel Plainview, you don't describe him uh, physically. You simply say, Daniel Plainview, late 30s at this point, uh, I, I had it written down, it's like he's, he, he's, there he is in the 110 degree heat of New Mexico hunting for silver. Oh, it's it's a, all you need, it's right? It's all you need, right? That's it's like, probably too much already. I could have taken but four it's all words action. out of that. It, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. But it's action as opposed to adjectives, and it just seemed like, and as yeah. I checked everywhere else in the script, it was like, yeah, there's no no mood, no purple, no, just it, it was all just whatever the heck they're doing, but it's in contradiction to wherever they are, like 110 degree heat. Right. There's a physical element of I mean, conflict. I was taught, I don't know where I learned this or who taught me, but like screenwriting is not real writing. It's, come on, it's not. You're not writing a book, you know. I mean, you're writing... The basics, you know, you are. Let's just the situation where they are and what they're doing should def t should should really say everything, you know, and um, and let and leave room for an actor to do something, you know. I was always always just felt like that was um, that that was good screenwriting. That you know, good writing was kind of belongs in not in books. It, mm -hmm. um, that that screenwriting should be is. Um, Absolutely as economic as po as possible, um, so that the filmmaking can take take over, so that an actor can take over, so that the camera can take over. You know, that it's best um, it becomes invisible. You know, it's yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think I got that early on because actors. Would, I knew I was friends with a lot of actors, and they say. You know, they'd read, they'd show, have scripts. They say, you know, we don't read any of that shit. We just read what our lines are. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, if they don't read it, why write it? You yeah, know? right. We had questions. Uh, uh, the next question, yeah, there, and then we'll we'll get to you. Hello, uh, the San Fernando Valley or the whole valley seems to play a, a pretty big part in a few of your movies, and in, in good, maybe most. So I was wondering if there is anything that maybe still kind of lingers, whether it be like an affinity or just like what kind of influences or impressions did that place, uh, that area leave on you as a, as a writer? And, and, and also maybe when does location come into play as a writer into your story? Um, well, you know, um, obviously the same way probably for anybody here that uh, that's where I was born and that's where I was raised, that's where I live now, and so I, I can only assume that that's, that's a huge, um, that, that's a huge, you know, that, that's a huge part of who you are, a huge part of what, what you've learned, where you come from, as tragic as that is, you know, I mean, it's just like, I mean, I wish it was someplace cooler or more, you know, but, um, but that's what you got, so you, you try to, you know, I don't, I think the second part of your question is something about, I'm sorry, but, but I didn't understand exactly. Do you mean if I had a mother? Uh, maybe it's the mic. Like wh where in the writing process? I mean, you have There's locations. characters, yeah. Right. But and, and how much do you like to give attention to it in, in the actual script? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, you know, good question. I mean, well, um, Fuck, good question. I don't really know. It's like, you know, if you've got a story like Boogie Nights, it's, it can't really take place anywhere else. I mean, I suppose it could. Mm -hmm. I suppose there's other places where pornography might have been made. Maybe well, well Boogie so Nights and Magnolia both both mm -hmm. are appropriate to San Fernando Valley specifically, right, right. but, you know, the, 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 the California that you portray in uh, There Will Be Blood is, right. is like a it, – it, what it has in common is the same bare – Desert and it's in the master too, but it's the, the, when the motorcycles in the desert. There's something that calls to you about those bare places, those right. wide open places that seems to be in you like a watermark wherever the you know wherever the characters are wound. I mean, up. listen, you know, yeah. it, uh, uh, the place that a story it takes place makes a lot of fucking difference to what's going on. You know, I mean, it does absolutely. You know, um, and, and I think the way like in the master, for instance, you know, it's it's no accident the way the um, the the that they start off in sort of San Francisco, they make their way over to New York, and that movement doesn't last very long in New York City. I mean, it's, it's like 
you know, it makes sense. It's sort of New York City. Get out of here. You know, they go to yeah. Philadelphia. And, and Freddie Quell doesn't last very long in Boston. He has to get out to the... Exactly. The, you know. Right. Freddie Quell, by, you know, doesn't last very long on land. You know, wherever he's like, you know, he's much better at sea. You yeah. Know? I mean, that's location. You know, having a character that obviously is so much more comfortable when he's at sea than when he's on land or in take him to the desert, you know. I mean, yeah. so take one of your characters and put them somewhere where they maybe don't want to be or they don't belong and see what happens, you know. Things will happen. Things inevitably will happen to people when they're out of place. Um, yeah. yeah, you know. Um, let's see, your question then yours. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering how you construct a story. I mean, it sounds like you get a lot of inspiration and in, in research, and you really get wrapped up in it, and you find all these gems. I mean, do you do you take all that and sort of just dump it out on the table and rearrange things, or I guess? Yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. And anything more than that, I'd be being disingenuous with you to say that I kind of can construct a story. I mean, I never feel like I know how the, to construct a story, except just like. That's a great way of what you just said, like, yeah, dumping things on a table and, like, spreading them around like that for sure and hopefully getting lucky enough to kind of get enough things going in a row that feels like something worth doing, something worth telling, something worth going to shoot. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of sadness, too, when you sort of can feel that you're maybe getting mm -hmm. to the end of something, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's an extraordinary scene at the close of The Master, and it, it, it snuck up on me. I, I didn't expect the, the climax to come so soon in a funny way, even though it's a long movie, but I'm, I'm like, the rhythm. It, 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 suddenly they're having this conversation, and it's a very, uh, the, the feeling under it that it communicates is something very specific, which is that you know, whatever the outcome of this conversation, whether they kill each other at the end of the conversation, or whatever happens, because you have, you have Dodd and, you have, and, and Quell, this is the last conversation they're ever going to have. Mm -hmm. you, you, they both know it, too. They're looking each other in the eye, and they actually, there's even an odd smile on Freddie Quell's face, which is actually, I think, helping us as viewers anticipate where, where this is really going. Mm -hmm. And Dodd is almost like fighting that, 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 that cruel little smile on Freddie's face because they, they both know that this is, the, this is the end of the road for their whole relationship. And it's a really interesting thing to feel. Sometimes it happens in life that you do feel I'm not going to see this person again. You just do, but you, you don't want that. It's like a terrible thing to feel, and and and, and you communicate that terrible feeling. And I was just wondering, when when did it? Did you know in advance that they were going to have to have this, or did you find out when you were writing it that the, oh my, uh, you know, was that? I don't remember. I mean, I think it was probably that I that I knew you know sooner or later I was going to have to end this film, and that, but that that yeah. but but that more importantly that their relationship would not work i think you probably intuitively knew probably about halfway through writing it is that probably like any romance that you maybe you realize uh, you know unfortunately I, I i think i'm writing a doomed romance rather than yeah. one that could survive you know right um exactly how that would play out maybe i wasn't quite sure but um yeah it it just well anyway it it, it it's the I think that, um, and I, I'm, it, it, some of my questions are a little unfair because I'm trying to get you to quantify something that can't be quantified except by the, by the thing itself, you know. But it is this, one of the things that is powerful that I'm hopeful that people can take away is the feeling of open-endedness that's sometimes there under, under each of your scenes because the, anything can happen, you feel, in these scenes. And it's a, nice, it's a great feeling to have, and it's, I feel like it's something to aspire to whatever kind of movie you're writing, you know, it's because the it was said of, say, um, Some Like It Hot, right? Because that's like, somebody said, why is that film erotic? You know, you, it's because Tony Curtis and Marilyn Monroe, you feel anything can happen when they're, when they're talking. It's just you don't know where it's going to go. And it's, it's, a, it's a great zone to get in, and you really got, got there in there. Uh, so That's great. That's funny. I mean, that's funny you should bring that up, because I was just watching that film the other day. And, you know, you, if, you know the, when that film starts, you'd have no, you know, unless you're, you could, it's possible that you could start the, be watch the beginning of that and, and not even know what film you're watching. Because it's like starts as this gangster film. You yeah. Know, and, yeah. Um, oh, what's his face? is walking around Spats Colombo. What's yes. his name? Uh, oh, know, George uh, Raft. George yeah. Raft yeah. running around. And so it, the, the navigation that that film takes does not kind of lead you to believe that you're watching this sort of classic comedy by Billy Wilder that's essentially going to end up on the beach and down by the Del Coronado, you know. But 
and then they're on the train for all that long time. I mean, it has a kind of whole pace it's all, it, that's all its own. And well, there's something. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I like that in my films. I I, yeah. I, I, prefer, I would prefer to be confused about where we're going, um, and and just kind of hand over the and 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 then no, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a, another question here, and then we'll. Yeah. Um, to kind of pay, piggyback off of uh, the last question, um, so much of the conversation has been about kind of the discovery process and not really knowing where you're going. And specifically, uh, I think in the Sydney commentary, you had uh, spoken to the, to the effect of um, if you don't know where the story is going, kind of just sit the two characters down in a coffee shop and have them talk until, until the story starts. Um, so to that end, now that you're working on in Inherent Vice, I Thomas Finchin. Finchin. Thomas Finchin, yeah. yeah. Um, and there's a book, and it's kind of, you have the characters, and everything's kind of set out for you. Is that more difficult? Are you kind of wrestling with that now that you know where you're going? Or well, um, it's nice just because it's different, you know, just because it's mm -hmm. different to be adapting a book, and um, and that's the most important thing is just keep an excitement going about writing and not ever be stale with it. And I mean, right now, if I felt like I was starting having to start back up to write something, I mean, I. I I just wouldn't probably be doing it. I'd just be so tired and exhausted. But the thrill of going to work every day is the thrill of working with someone else's amazing words and throwing them around and trying to see how they go together. And um, it's no less fun than coming with up something from the ground up. If anything, it's right now for me where I am in, in my life and my writing, it's more fun. It's more rewarding. I'm getting more out of it because it's not something I've ever done before and that's fucking great you know sick you know it's like so nice to be looking at words on a page that aren't that you didn't write you know you can just be so nauseated with stuff that you do and now it's you've got somebody else's stuff to play it's great a great feeling so as long as it lasts I want to keep writing it out I mean when you did you adapted there will be blood from Upton Sinclair and and it's often been remarked you know you only took you know the yeah. first hundred pages of the novel now that's that's not a bad. That's not a comment against you or Upton Sinclair, but it was an interesting attack. And uh, do you feel the same freedom with Pynchon to just say? No, not no, at no, first. I no, mean, I don't, yeah. but I probably should. I mean, if anything, it's sooner or later I'm going to have to kind of be harder on that book to to actually make a uh, to make a film about it. You're going to have to get um, very very hard on it, you know. Yeah. And that's and that's okay. I mean, anybody here has. I don't know, know if you've had, but. I used to like I used to like when I was younger I used to love like you know you'd be so self-satisfied with something that you write now the self-satisfaction comes from like oh the the joy of like a great cut you know the gr some great like red circle through something and a slash and two things get smashed together yeah oh it's the greatest feeling um it, it's just a high, you know, because yeah. so discovering something that you never thought could could smash together like that, and yeah, um, it's what keeps me coming back, you know, like you know that kind of thrill, yeah, um, yeah. and that's some of that. And then when that's happened with this, it's great, and hopefully it'll happen more. Question back there, yes, uh, uh, then you. Uh, oh, this. Uh, well, anyway. Yeah. Hi, uh, given your love of uh, words and characters and humanity. Have you ever considered writing and directing for the theater? No. I mean, I have. I would like to do that, but I've never done it. And That'd be great. That seems hard to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different set of demands, really. I, I mean. guess so. Yeah, nowhere to hide. <laughs> that's real writing. That's more real writing, <laughs> you know, again. Really, that's, yeah, because that's we have uh, your qu the question to the gentleman in the back, and then we get to yours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, w when you're talking about your writing, you leave a lot of room for discovery, and then you go and you have to make a, a film, and you talk about having a lot of discovery with your actors. Is there a, a, a conflict between the writer that's made a blueprint and the director who's on the set with the actor and says, I'm just going to go this way, or is it a continuous... Handoff that you're completely okay with, and oh, it's a continuous handoff that I'm completely okay with. You know, I don't have. I mean, I like, I completely fire the writer when we get to the set. Like, you know, um, 
I mean, he has to be hired again. You know, sometimes you get to a scene, you've got to, like, come up with something on the spot, and that's fun, and that's great. You know, you get to go type something up. You're like, oh, right, I'm a writer, and you type mm-hmm. something under. <laughs> but no, um, no, no. I'm so unprecious about um, my writing. Um, I try to be, at least. Every once in a while, there'll be something that you get really precious about, some some line or something, and you you'll kind of you'll go, wait, no, you missed that. You gotta say it like this, you know, and <laughs> just weird things that you get hung up on. But I'm not fussy about it at all. I don't I don't I know. I'm don't care. Don't really care. Just wanna kind of look at something in front of me that seem that seems like it's going well and right. And usually actors would be if it's written well, they'll say something that you wrote and it'll be great. And but usually if they kind of – they'll say something better if they can co- – if it's coming out of their mouth in a certain way. And yeah. I'm just not fussy about that at all. And usually they really come – like if anything, um, y- you know, I write too much sometimes. You know, we had a scene like in, in The Master and with um, Freddie and his uh, – Clark, the the uh, great actor Rami Malek, who uh, gets married to the daughter-in-law. Anyway, they're mm-hmm. they're going to kick the shit out of John Moore, and there's a, st- a, a walk and talk on this street that we did, and Rami had this, d- you know, unfortunate mission of kind of spewing out all this dialogue that I'd written him about how he met Master and what's he going on with him and everything. I mean, it was like a page of what I thought was really good writing, you know, and like mm-hmm. the day before. Joaquin's like, well, so we're, you want us to kind of say all that stuff walking down the street? I was like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. You know? <laughs> and then like later that afternoon, like, so you want you want me to say all of that stuff? Like, what? You know, and finally I was like, you know, he's hinting at it. He doesn't hint it at anything else along the way here. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah, you're right. This is fucking horrible. You know, it was really bad. <laughs> no, I think I said, well, let's just do it once, you know, and they did it once and they walked and talked on the street and he did a great job of getting it out. And then we did it a couple more times. I said, okay, what if you guys just walk down the street and don't say anything? <laughs> and they walked down the street and they didn't say anything. And it was like, that's fucking great. It was <laughs> because it was what they do. They'd walk down the street and they didn't say, they were going to kick the shit out of somebody. They weren't going to stop for a conversation, you know. We have time for one more question. This gentleman here in the blue shirt. Um, I was just wondering how many of your stories are based on actual experiences versus sort of seeking to explore something that you've never done before through writing? Hmm. That's a great question. That's a great question. (laughs) That's heavy stuff, (laughs) man. Um, Well, lots of, so many things, um, that com- come from either my life or stories that I've heard in my life. From, but I suppose, yeah, I mean, I have to. So wait, the second part of the question is something that you wish to explore with your life. I mean, yeah, I mean, does a character fulfill something that, like, I mean, you know, for example, Daniel Plains, yeah, well, wait. uninhibited. Now, does he get to you get to put on the big boots and, and walk for you in some way? Or no, uh, no. Yeah. What I was thinking about more importantly was that there was a moment when you're sta- we were standing out in the middle of the desert and there's a train coming down the tracks and there we are with this camera and you sort of look around and you think, this is a, a fucking absurd. You know, you are completely ha- fulfilling some fantasy. You're making a movie out in the desert with a train and guys and with these this yeah. gear on. You think this is like wish fulfillment, you know? Like mm. a, you've got a train. I felt the same way when we were out on a boat in San Francisco Harbor. You're touring around. You've got, you know, you've got a movie camera and mm. just just the thrill of doing that, thrill of having that experience. Now, that portion of it is wish fulfillment. I mean, that's the kind of joy and the boyish thrill of of, of doing this thing. That's so you just feel so fucking lucky to do it but in terms of the characters i can only assume yeah that you are funneling some part of you wholeheartedly i hope Mm. into them and through them um you know so yeah so i mean how many times have i wanted to say to somebody i'm gonna come into your room in the middle of the night and cut your fucking throat i mean a lot you know (laughs) (laughs) Well, this but I don't. <laughs> well, speaking of wholehearted thrills, this has been so great, Paul. And, and you guys have been great. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.